Across the United States, Vera Kuhn has established 25 summer camps and drill grounds where those German-Americans who believe in Nazi teachings can imitate Hitler's mighty military machine. At New York meetings designed to promote friendship and end the U.S. boycotts on German goods, uniformed Nazis parade. Sieg Heil! Sieg Heil! Their mere appearance doubles the picket line. In 1932, the United States was perched right on the verge of going fascist. The preceding several presidents occupying our White House had been agents of the London Allied Banks on Wall Street stretching all the way back to Theodore Roosevelt, the nephew of the Chief of Intelligence for the Confederate States of America, who became president over the corpse of William McKinley. Woodrow Wilson was a personal advocate of the Ku Klux Klan, who preached the American version of Hitler's race science. Calvin Coolidge, with his Treasury Secretary Andrew Mellon, oversaw the speculation binge of the Roaring Twenties, which set the stage for the Great Crash of 1929, which Herbert Hoover responded to with bailout after bailout, not for the people, but for the Wall Street banks. And those very same Wall Street banks were at that same time funneling cash into the campaign coffers of none other than Hitler and Mussolini. The American people, driven to desperation, were organizing themselves into vigilante mobs, roaming the countryside armed with shotguns, hanging sheriffs who attempted to foreclose on farms, and threatening fellow citizens at gunpoint to dump their produce onto the dusty roads in a desperate attempt to drive the prices of their own products up on the open market. The conditions were ripe for dictatorship in the United States which the British intended to cultivate in parallel with their puppet in Germany, Adolf Hitler. But then, Roosevelt emerged. In 1932 in Chicago, it drove almost all other topics out of the minds of the people. Already, Franklin D. Roosevelt was the favorite for the nomination. Franklin D. Roosevelt, having received more than two-thirds of all the delegates voting, I proclaim him the nominee of this convention for President of the United States. Roosevelt was the embodiment of the American system, the legacy of Alexander Hamilton, and for many recalled the better age of Abraham Lincoln when the United States had defended itself from traitors within and built itself out of a crisis with great projects such as the Transcontinental Railroad funded by Lincoln's sovereign national currency, the Greenbacks. Roosevelt spoke directly to the people, identified the nation's failings, declared war on the economic royalists on Wall Street, and brought to life the image of how the recovery he promised would work. I pledge myself to a new deal for the American people. Today, we already have a fascist president. Adolf Hitler is occupying our presidency. And every day that passes brings us that much closer to the consolidation of Obama's Nazi regime. His campaign was funded by the exact same interests which funded Hitler's rise to power. And he is intended to serve exactly the same purpose, to bring the world to the brink of a third world war and to commit holocausts which would make Hitler's look pale in comparison. And the disintegration of the empire's euro system puts this genocidal agenda on an accelerated timetable as their time runs out. The parallels are obvious. And in fact, increasing numbers of people have begun to say just this, that Obama's legalization of indefinite detention, assassination of American citizens, the revocation of trial by jury, and his dictatorial violations of the separation of powers mandated by our Constitution, these are crimes which make Obama a carbon copy of Hitler today. And for this, he must be impeached. However, what's the delay? 
Why is there still hesitation to go for the jugular on this issue? Why do the American people still seem willing, in the main, to accept the Nazification of the United States? Is it a lack of awareness? Doubtful. LaRouche called Obama out almost three years ago, comparing him to Nero and Adolf Hitler in a public broadcast in spring of 2009. And ever since, the LaRouche pack has been on the streets everywhere with posters showing Obama with a Hitler mustache. Lack of awareness is not the problem. The problem is a mass demoralization. After eight years of a Bush presidency and almost four years of Obama, our people have lost the sense that they have a birthright as citizens of this nation. Maybe it's there in theory, but as a living passion which will cause people to stand up and fight, it's been beaten out of them again and again. Even the Republican opposition to Obama among the so-called candidates for president are meant to be a clown show, a parade of fools intended to demoralize our people even more. It's as if we find ourselves once more in the year 1932, but only this time there's a missing ingredient, FDR, the Roosevelt factor. For this reason, Lyndon LaRouche has decided that he will be recording a live video discussion with all six members of the national candidate slate. As he stated last night, our weapon today is the fact that he knows how to organize a recovery. LaRouche knows scientifically how to make a recovery happen, something which is a clear advantage over our enemies, all of them. And we have to make the image of that recovery program real. To bring Roosevelt to life once more, to give our people their birthright back and rally a citizenry with their pride restored, to give people the spine to say, we don't have to suffer these crimes. Germany had Hitler, but we had FDR. The fact is that we're not going to survive unless we, as, we establish not just a Glass-Steagall approach. The situation is very precise. First of all, you cannot save the United States from hell and yourself from hell if you do not cause the removal of this president from office. That's your first obligation. But there are other contingencies that you also have to bring into consideration at the same time. But if you're not committed to throw this president out of office immediately, you aren't thinking in a way that's going to produce any results. You can't. All right, that's number one. Now, what do we have to do? You committed, first of all, you're committed, you're going to throw this son of a bitch out of office. Because he's insane, he's a mass murderer, he's worse than Hitler. Huh? Therefore, he's going to be thrown out of here, our office. And you will want that to happen. That's what you're depending upon. That's what you're going to insist happens. You won't take no for an answer. He's thrown out. That's number one. What are you going to do? What you're actually going to do? Very simple. You're going to demand Glass-Steagall without any reforms of it. Franklin Roosevelt's Glass-Steagall with no single change in it. Because if you open up a change, somebody else will open up a change, and then you have no real Glass-Steagall. You have a mutilated Glass-Steagall that won't mean anything. So no change, word for word, jot for jot, tittle for tittle. Everything that was said in Glass-Steagall originally will be said again now, with no change in the pitch. That's number one. If you don't do that, you're going to lose. And you've got to think about what I said. You know? No changes. No backing off. No compromises. That's required. Now, Glass-Steagall will do what? In that way. When done in that way, presuming this bum is thrown out of office or is being thrown out of office or suspended from office, you know? what are you going to do next? The problem is... What you do with Glass-Steagall in the form that Roosevelt prescribed it and did it, 
Huh? Means what? It means that you're going to take all the money that's owed on all kinds of money, and you're going to take the money you classify in a certain way. That's all you're going to accept. That's all you're going to say. That's all you're going to defend. You are not going to spend a penny of U.S. assets on bailing out merchant banking or similar kinds of swindles or gambling. Not a penny. But however, the problem is when you do that and you enact Glass-Steagall with that provision in mind, you find that you have saved not enough money in the system, in the commercial banking system and its extensions to actually revive the economy. All you'll be able to do is stabilize the economy at best at the level it's already at, which is a, cri a crashing level. So therefore, you don't stop with Glass-Steagall. You start with it, you don't stop it with it. Mm. What you do is you now go to another sector. You establish, re-establish the constitutional specifications for a national banking institution. A national banking institution is a credit system. There's no, there's no money coming out of the pockets of the citizens, of the voters. No money coming out of their pockets on this thing, convention. The federal government is creating credit, fungible credit. And this fungible credit will be used as money paid in to cover investments and production. You will have money you put out there because some people are very poor and they have no resources whatsoever. You're going to, you're going to cover it. You're going to give them the relief they need. Eh? Then you have people who are qualified to work, have got, uh, so now you, those people who can work will have jobs. They won't have make work jobs though, generally. We don't want make work jobs. We want programs of production and similar kinds of services. Eh? which will rebuild the economy. Now, the, if you're trying to get, use taxpayer money or cuts in other things to, to get more of the taxpayer money into, uh, into these investments, you're not going to make it. Because the, you cannot, with the existing flow of money through the economy, you cannot extract enough out of it to cause a recovery. This is a problem that the Asians have a problem in understanding, because they still they believe in, in monetary systems. They've been taught monetary systems. What you have to have is you have to have a fixed exchange rate system, yes, but it has to be that kind of system. So therefore, you have you will create far more credit to a credit system than you could ever extract as tax payments or tax support to the economy. Never. So therefore, you, but now you have to cancel the monetary system. You uh, cancel it and replace it instantly by law with a national banking system. Now, what, how do you do that? Well, first of all, you've got the Federal Reserve System. It is hopelessly bankrupt. Don't meddle with it. Don't touch it. It's stinking shit, and you don't want to bring it home. <laughs> So we, we're going to cancel the Federal Reserve System, the, the, the Woodrow Wilson Federal Reserve System. You're going to cancel it because it's worthless. And you're not going to, you're not going to pile worthless debt on per, worth, worthless debt and revive an economy that way. So you have to cancel the monetary system and go back to what was intended in our Constitution to be a credit system, just like was done in Massachusetts Bay Colony you know, under the pine tree shilling, exactly the same thing. And the pine tree shilling system in Massachusetts had a rate of growth, of net physical growth, which exceeded all the best they could do in Britain under a monetary system. So credit system is the lawful design for the U.S. Constitution. And we can create more credit. We can create as many, much credit huh, 
as there are people who need jobs. Not because they need jobs, but because they need to be productive. And the only way a credit system works is on being productive, which means things like NAWAPA. So you take a few major driving programs, you know, just as you would in warfare, except you do something. In warfare, you generally don't do much production. You do more reduction than production. But then, now you, now you, have, you can have all the jobs you want that people can do because you will assign federally-backed programs, federal programs and federally-sponsored programs under a credit system. And the credit system will provide the employment and the materials needed to build the economy. And the rate in which you will develop the economy will far exceed anything you can ever do with a tax-based system. Yeah, we'll have taxes, but it's, it's the tax base, that's only part of the economy. We want a much larger economy. We want big projects, what Roosevelt did in the 1930s. Big projects, which may start with labor which is not very skilled, but is going to become skilled by a kind of selective processing. Yeah? That'll work. Now, what do we need also? We need to get rid of the greenies effectively, by telling him, well, we won't kill you if you stop being a greenie. Mm -hmm. yeah. No, you, because what you've got to do is you've got to actually get into very high orders of, of technology in production. Without very high orders of technology, you cannot succeed even with a credit system. So the credit system is not going to be a make-work jobs. It's going to be work jobs, not wake-work jobs. And if people aren't skilled, they're going to learn to become skilled. They're going to be put in a program, program of graduation from less skilled to more skilled. We're going to increase the energy flux density of the throughput per capita per square kilometer of territory. And that will work. And nothing else will work. <laughs>